Thank you so much for being here tonight. We are here for a joyous occasion. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with my introduction. I have personally been really looking forward to hosting Hill Malatino on his on tour for his latest book, Side Effects on Being Trans and Feeling Bad. And joining Hill tonight in conversation is Zena Sharman, author of The Care We Dream of Liberatory and Transformative Approaches to LGBTQ Plus Health. And I know that this, um, I feel like I wouldn't be able to you know, um, give this introduction without acknowledging the state that the world is in, especially in relationship to transgender individuals um, and the lives that, um, I come from a lived experience. So the lives that myself and all of my um, trans siblings are, you know, facing um, and the hate rhetoric that is going out. So these kinds of events are especially important. And this kind of literature, got my copy today, is very important um, in informing those of us who are, not up to speed and who um, are actively choosing to believe a rhetoric um, against our existence. So I'm very privileged, grateful to be the host tonight um, and to pass things over to Hill and Dina in just a second. So just a little bit about myself and Whitewell quickly. I'm Halsey, the events coordinator at Whitewell Bookstore. Whitewell Bookstore is a family owned general interest independent store located in the Bloomfield neighborhood of Pittsburgh. Our store motto is conversation, community and culture and we strive to be a home for book lovers. Our events programming features local, national and international writers and translators reading, discussing and celebrating literature of all genres and for all ages. A few events coming up that we think you might be interested in. Um, we're excited to celebrate a new anthology from UGA Press, The Long Devotion, Poets Writing Motherhood, and we'll be joined online by contributors uh, Zaina Hashem Beck, Joy Katz, and Emily Moan Slate, as Emily Moan Slate, as well as editors Emily Perez and Nancy Reddy. And it's a really great reading, um, so don't miss it. And then on Tuesday, May 24th at 7 p.m., we're thrilled to virtually host William Brewer in celebration for his latest, The Red Arrow. William will be in conversation with Nima Avashia, author of Another Appalachia, Growing Up Queer and Indian in a Mountain Place. And you can join us online for that. You can find out more about these events and RSVP if they're online at whitewellbookstore.com. So just a few notes and housekeeping on our Zoom settings. You will notice that you are not able to turn your cameras on um, or turn your mics on. And that is just a security precaution that we take. You are only able to message me, your host in the chat. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, whether that be about tech things or about um, bookstore things, I am your go-to. So please feel free to send me a message. And you will have the opportunity to ask our um, wonderful visitors this evening some questions. So at any point, if you have questions, I will be keeping track of all of them in a Word document. And then I will be moderating the Q&A with the last um little bit at the end. So please send me your questions um, at any time. And then of course, take a look at the reactions button. This is a great place to contribute. Even though we aren't in person, you can use the heart emoji or the clap emoji. Or if you um, hear something that surprises you, you can always use the wow emoji. I definitely encourage you to use those liberty um, you know, just so that you can interact with the readers and their work. Um, if you would like to send any messages of praise or gratitude to Zena or Hill, please feel free to message those to me as well. We do edit down the chat and then forward those to our readers. So they will be able to hear all of your praise and kind comments um, and gratitude as well. And so just uh, so that you know what to expect this evening, um, once I introduce uh, Zena and Hill, I'll turn things over to Zena. And then um, Zena will talk a little bit about her book. And then after um, Zena's done, I'll turn things over to Hill. And then Hill will talk a little bit about his book. And then they will um, talk to each other um, about their books and each other's books. And then we'll move into the Q&A. And I think that's all I have logistically. Now we get to get to the bread and butter of the evening. I get to introduce our two wonderful um, guests. Oh, I actually switched it around. Hill is reading first and Zena is reading second. Um, thank you so much, Zena. Uh, messaged me in the chat. I appreciate you, Zena. Thank you so much. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce the two of them. Um, a little bit about Hill. 
Hill Malatino is assistant professor in the departments of women's gender and sexuality studies and philosophy at Penn State. He is the author of Side Effects on Being Trans and Feeling Bad from Minnesota 2022, Trans Care, also from Minnesota, published in 2020, and Queer Embodiment, Monstrosity, Medical Violence, and Intersex Experience. And then a little about Zena. Zena Sharman is a writer, speaker, and strategist and LGBTQ plus health advocate. She's the author of three books, including The Care We Dream Of, Liberatory and Transformative Approaches to LGBTQ plus Health, published by Arsenal Pulp Press in the fall of 2021. Zena edited the Lambda Literary Award-winning anthology, The Remedy, Queer and Trans Voices on Health and Healthcare. She's also an engaging speaker who brings her passion for LGBTQ plus health to audiences of healthcare providers, students, and community members at universities and conferences across North America. You can learn more about Zena and her work at zenasharman.com, and I'll drop that link in the, ch in the chat in just a few minutes. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to turn things over to Hill. Hey, y'all. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, and thank you, Halsey, for that great introduction. And just to clarify, we're introducing the books, myself, then Zena, and then we'll go toggle back to the readings. Yes, Zena? Or just do it all at once? Do it all at once. Okay. We'll do it all at once. So yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, I wanted to start with just a short land acknowledgement. So I teach at Penn State, and I live in a little village outside of Penn State. Penn State is one of the largest land-grant institutions in the United States. The main campus that I teach at is the ancestral land of the Susquehannock peoples and also several member tribes of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. But because Penn State is such a massive institution, the land sessions that comprise Penn State um, number over 50 across 16 states, and they were um, expropriated from over 112 tribes. So I want to note that at the outset. And also thank Zena um, for doing this event with me. It's like a total dream event. And yeah, so a little bit to enframe the book, I'll keep this really brief because I know we started a bit late. I wrote Side Affects um, largely because I was really, really sick of dominant discourses regarding trans, um, the importance of trans inclusion and trans representation. I thought they were extremely limited and mostly tended to tarry with a kind of respectability politic that I was not, a fan of, I remain not a fan of. Um, and the other reason I wrote it is because I thought that just in both in dominant discourses, mainstream discourses on transness, as well as um, resistant discourses on transness, I feel like there wasn't enough attention paid to the durability of negative affect um, at all points during, before, after the transition process. And I also think period the temporality of transition and the way that we narrate the pre and post of it is also really problematic, which is part of what I write about in the book. Um, so I wanted to write about the bad feelings that attend a trans experience. But while working on the book, I found it so overwhelming, I wrote another book about trans care practices um, <laughs> to keep myself sort of together as I was spending many hours of my life um, tracking and meditating on the different forms of negative affect or bad feeling that attend trans lives. So, okay, I will stop talking about the book and just read a little bit from a chapter um, on rage, which I think is appropriate given the political climate um, in the US in particular. So the chapter is called Tough Breaks, Trans Rage and the Cultivation of Resilience. And it has two epigraphs. The first is from Susan Stryker and it's rage gives me back my body as its own fluid medium. And the second, is from one of my mentors, Maria Lugonis, who passed a couple of years ago. Um, and it's from an essay of hers called Hard to Handle Anger. And the quote is, rage is equated by dominators with hysteria or insanity. So I'll just read the first couple of pages of this and then we'll get right to Zena. Um, so this section, the first section is called The Productivity of Rage, The Work of the Break. Pop psychology would have us believe that anger is only a mask for sadness a carapace protecting us from feeling the effects of a much deeper woundedness. It has been analyzed within psychotherapeutic literature as a form of problem anger, and countless strategies have been developed in order to help folks therapeutically manage it. It tends to be analyzed in highly individuated terms as a problem endemic to individuals to be resolved, typically through a therapeutic relationship at the level of the individual. 
The few social scientific analyses that theorize rage as a social phenomena tend to focus on the way it shapes majoritarian, hegemonic forms of subjectivity. That is, they analyze the rage of the privileged, the forms of rage driven by entitlement and characterized by intersections of xenophobia, racism, sexism, transphobia, and homophobia. Anger is, within these readings, that which protects the subject from experiencing the full psychic impact of trauma. It is a dissimulating mask that deflects attention away from profound hurt, that supports an idea of the subject as inviolable, impenetrable. It is a defense reaction that stands in the way of supposed true healing, a roadblock on the way to recovery. We are told that one of the unfortunate aspects of anger is that it's too often coupled with a conviction of moral righteousness a righteousness that can be utilized to justify all manner of belligerent violence, all kinds of acting out and acting up. Anger is almost exclusively understood as negative, as a negative deleterious emotion that is best worked through and then discarded. The possible resurgence of anger must be guarded against. If it does reemerge, it should be prevented, contained, we're told. I turn away from such culturally dominant articulations of rage and toward feminist philosophical reevaluations of supposed negative affect because I seek a different way of interpreting anger, a different mode of understanding the phenomenon of rage. I think, contra popular understandings of the effects of rage, that it offers a critical resource for minoritized subjects. Engaging the work of women of color feminist theorists and trans scholars, activists, and artists. This chapter examines how rage is key to the survival of minoritized subjects. It is an energy that propels us toward more possible futures, an energy that encourages us to break those relationships that do not sustain us, that do not support our flourishing. In other words, I explore how rage is transformative in world building, not merely a negative affective force that compromises flourishing and impedes the cultivation of resilience. Thanks. So before Zena starts again, really fast, I just want to reiterate how totally excited I am to be sharing this event with her. Um, and also say that from the moment that I began working on, I think my first book, Queer Embodiment, I was accompanied by, by her work, um, specifically the book, The Remedy, which completely recalibrated what I thought might be possible in terms of queer and trans affirming healthcare. Um, and yeah, her thinking has just remained a constant companion of mine for almost a decade now, right? Um, and I'm not even talking about Persistence, right? The, the book on Butch Femme that came out in 2011, I believe, which I'm also a huge fan of. So I'm just so stoked to hear from you and share this and I'll zip now so we can hear from you. Hill Malatino, I just love you. I really do. And I'm so happy to be here. Um, so I want to first begin just really by offering another apology for the access fail. I know that we advertised this event as having ASL and CART. There was a captioner and transcription, or sorry, and, and interpreters booked and something happened. They're not here. So just again, to really reaffirm our commitment to posting a captioned recording and a transcript later so folks can have some access, which I know is not the same, but um, just really wanting to anchor into that commitment to, to putting disability justice into practice. Um, Part of that as well is I'll just offer a brief visual image description. So um, I am uh, a person with peachy skin, a white person with curly silver hair, and, and I'm wearing a black headset and cat eye glasses and hot pink lipstick. And you can't see it, but my shirt says protect trans kids. Um, I'm showing up to you today from the unceded territories of the Coetzin peoples, which is on the west coast of Canada. So really conscious of being a cis person, someone in a different context than many of you who I know are joining from the States and really thinking about one part of the genocidal colonial history of the lands that many of us are on, which is that white supremacy and settler colonialism included the violent imposition of the gender binary on so many Indigenous children, as well as murdering and harming them, and that we, we need to really think about the deep interconnectedness of, of all of these struggles. So 
honoring where where I'm showing up from in all its complexities and, and in all of my limitations. Um, and really grateful to be here to celebrate Hill's work. Um, Hill, your work is such a companion of mine. And I think with your work and you offer me different vocabularies of feeling uh, truly the only definition of resilience that I like. Um, all the other ones kind of make me a bit mad. And um, yeah, I just really feel like I was so closely traveling with your work through the creation of the care we dream of. So um, it feels really alive and present for me and continues to be. And with that, I'm, I'm going to read from an essay, actually, Hill, that you read the very, very first iteration of. Um, it shapeshifted a lot, but it's a piece from the Care We Dream Of, which is uh, a book that combines a number of long essays by me with really amazing uh, interviews and contributions from 15 other queer and trans folks from across North America, imagining what liberatory and transformative healthcare might look like. Um, so it's very much an act of, of radical dreaming. So this essay is called Queer Alchemy, Perverting the Health System, Fighting to Win. And you'll hear me talk about a mirror in the beginning of this essay, and it references a gold mirror that was made by the artist Lex Nonscripta that has lived in my bedroom for years, and it has a line from the Queer Nation manifesto on it. It says, every time we fuck, we win. My LGBTQ plus health work is motivated by a desire to keep queer and trans people alive in the face of conditions that harm or kill us. I too am driven by love, grief, and rage. Still, I sometimes fear I've been lulled into complacency. I notice where I've let the comfort of people who hold power in institutions like universities, medical schools, or hospitals diminish the force of my demands and my condemnations. Some part of me believed if I asked nicely and didn't ask for more than they could give without ceding power, control, or resources, they would care enough to keep us alive. How often was I wrong? At what cost to my community? Any of us who work in the field of queer and trans health are also members of the LGBTQ plus community. We live and work in contexts that try to force us to conform and hide the parts of ourselves deemed too unruly, too abnormal, too pathological, too perverted. This conformity becomes both a survival strategy and a means of gaining access to the systems and institutions we are trying to change. Yet, as Elisa Bieria wrote on behalf of radical anti-violence organization, communities against rape and abuse. The dissonance of maintaining a real identity and a disguised one creates significant amounts of stress and consumes considerable amounts of precious time and resources that should be spent organizing. Assimilate is a verb. It suggests an active process. Action takes energy. I am learning to remember that pervert is a verb too. Its origins are in old French and Latin words meaning to undo, destroy, and subvert, to turn, transform, be changed. To pervert something is to alter its course, meaning, or state, to distort or corrupt what was originally intended. It's often used in the negative, quote unquote, to pervert the course of justice. But if the system you are trying to change is fundamentally rooted in oppression, should it not be perverted? Disabled Puerto Rican Jewish writer and activist Aurora Levins Morales writes, it's worth discovering who your political ancestors are, tracing your genealogies of empowerment, Today, when I look into that small gold mirror on my altar, I see my face reflected back to me, and it reminds me who I am, where I come from, and who I'm accountable to. I feel a kinship with the generations of queer and trans ancestors who loved, fucked, and fought their way toward more liberated futures. I make a practice of thanking those ancestors. 
I promise to live and work in ways that will offer similar gifts to our descendants. I promise to pervert the system. It's no coincidence that queer perverts taught me how to take a punch and how to throw one, how to achieve deep and precise impact without inadvertently damaging the delicate, breakable places you want to avoid. And the truth is, I want to pummel the systems and institutions killing the queer and trans people I love. I want to punch them into an entirely different shape or make them disappear altogether so we can grow something new in their place. I want to pervert these systems and institutions to let forth with the full force of the love, grief, and rage that propel me in this work. I want to stop pulling my punches. I love that section so oh. much, Zena. That's like such, that's one of my favorite moments of the Care We Dream of. Thank you. And I'm wondering, I, want, I was like, we should start with perversion. Let's start with perversion. Um, but Great. I know because <laughs> I know because we've talked about it before um, in a meeting just, just that you and I had a little while ago that you're thinking about critiques of normative familial arrangements, but you're also thinking about what you call in the care we dream of family as a technology of survival as well. So I'm wondering, maybe it's a big question, but how you're thinking about pervert as a verb in relationship to the family these days. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that is a complex and layered question for a number of reasons, right? Like, I mean, part of it's certainly around, obviously, the, the, the terrifying and violent rhetorics that are being applied to, to queer and trans parents and families, you know, like I'm thinking of the groomer language and things like that, um, and the very real fear that, that many parents I know feel. Um, and of course, all the ways in which whiteness, being cis, being in this part of my life, you know, comfortably middle class or more, um, being non-disabled, like insulates my family and me from the kinds of intrusions from the state that could happen in other contexts. Um, and I mentioned that because something I write about in the book is that I am in a, in a queer family. You know, I'm co-parenting now three kids. We have five week old, five and a half week old baby twins and a four-year-old uh, with three other queer people in a family structure of our own making. So, you know, I'm very interested in those kinds of queer kinship practices and like, how do we practice this kind of world building now? Um, I'm also taking a short course in family abolition right now. So have been reading deeply about family abolition in the mornings while my family sleeps. So that has been, I think, a fascinating juxtaposition. And I'm, I'm still inside that, that space of thinking. Um, but I feel like there's a part of me that is very interested in thinking with abolition in the amazing, imaginative, transformative work that I think is so present in your work as well. Like, how do we how do we imagine alternate possibilities and also engage in prefigurative practices in the now? Um, because I also think, as I know you do, about the pragmatic realities of care work, like the complexities of care work, the intensity of care work, um, and that there is so much care to be given and to be received. Um, so really wanting to be inside that. And I mean, the last thing I would say on this, and then would love to hear what you think is, like also how do we be in a space of deep intergenerational solidarity? So like at a super practical level, we're raising our kids gender open because we trust our children to tell us who they are, right? Um, which means intervening on systems at multiple levels. But I think for me at a deeper level, becoming a parent, especially in my 40s now, has me thinking so much about like, what does it mean to be in deep and genuine solidarity with children and young people, not just the ones in my house, but all of them, you know, with older adults, like in a community so impacted by ageism and of course, disabled folks, because there's so many points of intersection in systemic ageism and ableism that I think really impact the richness of our communities and our ability to work together for change in ways that don't leave people behind. So yeah, really, really sitting with all of those questions. Um, definitely more questions than answers, but I am certainly interested in the everyday learning I'm doing in my own house um, in this work of family making. 
Yeah. I mean, I think about this stuff all the time and I actually wanted to run what I'm about to talk about through how you address aging and dying and the care we dream of as, as you know, you and several other thinkers are talking about what it means to get old um, and to want to get old as a queer person, as a trans person. And I think I want to start with an anecdote actually before getting into this. And it has to do with my mother um, and my mom passed in September of this past year, in September of 2021. And I won't go into the details of that. Um, we had a complicated relationship, but in the last few months of her life, I got the mock-up um, for side affects, like the cover. And I showed her it, she didn't know the title of the book. And she looked at the title of the book and she hated the title of the book. And I thought, oh, well, it's too late to change it now. So I guess I'll just have to live with this knowledge that my mother hated the title of this book. Um, but what was interesting is she looked at the subtitle and was like, I'm being trans and feeling bad. And then looked at me and said, but your transhood hasn't been that bad. And I thought, oh, this is so interesting because it really spoke to this massive sort of maybe gulf of misunderstanding between her and I, but also to the things that I'd never been able to speak with her about in terms of the specificity of forms of like depression, anxiety, substance abuse that I understood to be very much attached to, to being trans and to grappling with what it meant to be trans. Um, and I began thinking about that dissonance a lot because to her, right, my transhood seemed to encompass the years during which I was visibly hormonally transitioning um, and not the decades before that, or really what was to come after. And, and the fact that I was just realizing that this was her conception of, of not just my transness, but transness sort of more broadly as she was passing was poignant to me, I think for, for many, many different reasons. But one of them had to do with the fact that largely the negative affect that I write about in side affects as it's played out in my own personal life had convinced me for a very long time that I probably wouldn't get old. Um, wouldn't be able to get old. And also, I think a lot of the um, fallout from the sort of negative effects I discuss in the book, rage, burnout, envy, fatigue, numbness, et cetera, um, meant that grappling with those took precedence over doing the work of like planning for what it would mean to be alive into my 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and hopefully I will be alive into those decades. Um, and I think that that experience is relatively common and folks who are lucky enough, privileged enough to come into middle age, I think as trans or queer, often find themselves in a situation where it's like, well, fuck, I didn't prepare for this at all. And I'm not even sure in terms of infrastructure, what I need to do <laughs> to, to get ready, right? For what it means to be old. And that has, that inflects the way that the decisions people make around kinship, it, inflex the decisions people make around um, parenting, but also the economics of, of transition means that for so many folks, what little money they have has gone into facilitating transition and not towards retirement and not towards being housed. Um, and the list can go on and on. So, yeah. So there's something about negative affect and transness that really comprises or not comprises, really complicates this idea of family as a technology of survival. Well, simultaneously, the, the care networks, the care webs that trans folks piece together um, are of course like crucially a part of that technology of survival. So I'm just thinking about all this in relationship to your work and you know, stop there, see what you wanna say. I mean, as you know, Hill, I have 20 pages of notes <laughs> on all of your books that I took because I did a read of new ones and a reread of older ones while holding babies in April. I'm just dropping books everywhere now. Um, so I'm seeing that because there's like seven different things popping into my mind right now. Classic Gemini move. Um, and, and one of the things I want to offer back to you in a way that I hope will feel good and not weird are your own words. Um, which is there's, there's a question you ask inside affects where you say, 
how can we think futurity without acquiescing to the narrative lures of optimism, salvation, rebirth, redemption? And also, and I put these together in, in my notes for, for today, in trans care, and you're talking about trans kids here, you say, I want them, trans kids, to have trans elders to turn to, and I want them to have the chance to become trans elders themselves, right? And I feel like there's, there's something about the conjoining of those ideas from those two books and um, thinking about how many people I know are surprised to still be alive, right? And, you know, I think in different ways, you and I work with negative affect, you know, tarrying with the negative as, as you talk about in, in this book, um, because for me, it feels like actually a really rich and vital place to be. It feels like a, a crucible, you know, in terms of a place where transformation can happen. Um, I also am definitely the friend that that is like, hey, do you have your healthcare proxy paper organized? Do you have a will? They're not just for rich people. What do you want to happen to your body when you die? Um, how are we going to take care of each other when we get old? And some of that for me, I feel like is that fem ethic of care. Some of it, you know, like you, I lost my mom as a younger person. You know, she died in 2014 at 66. Um, so I'm seven years out from losing her. And um, I was her, her caregiver, you know, at distance, but like the only child of a single mother. And that was, that was an incredibly um, challenging, transformative powerful experience um, that I was like just in the aftermath of when I put together the remedy, like that book, I created it like in the two years after she died. Um, and the care we dream of is like me years later, having done an immense amount of grief work, you know, and, and really being in a different stage, being a parent, um, which I never imagined I would be until I came into the particular family formation that I'm in. So yeah, just to offer, like, I think there, there is, something about what you're doing and side effects and something I find really compelling about like the feelings and states that we are somehow not supposed to think and talk about some of which is because they've been rendered unimaginable and then some of it is the like if you say it out loud it's going to happen like if you ask someone if they're feeling suicidal they're going to die by suicide right which is like actually the opposite of what is real right like how do we destigmatize these conversations um which i mentioned specifically because i know that the, that there's specific discussion of that in the care redream of also in a really kind of practical sort of way um but i'm also thinking about something you write about in trans care and also in side effects and i wonder if you could talk about this um, and maybe explain the concept it, which which is one i've i've needed to kind of sit with to feel like i i really understand which is this idea of an infra political ethics of care um, and it's this infra politics thing that's kind of been been hard for my brain to wrap around but then when you explain it in writing i feel like i really get what it looks like in practice so if you could bring that concept to life for folks as you see it in trans communities, I feel like it's also really relevant in this moment. Yeah, absolutely. So the the like scholar part of my brain wants to really make sure that I give the citation. So the concept of infra politics comes from the work of James C. Scott and specifically a book of his called Domination and the Arts of Resistance. And he coined the term to think about how so much of the work, you could think of it as care labor, right? But I think it encompasses other forms of labor as well, um, that supports the possibilities of what we understand as legible political resistance is work that hasn't historically properly counted as political. Um, so he coins the term infra political to think about all of, in some ways, like all of the shit work, all of the checking in with folks that make something like a strike action possible. And for me, thinking about the infrapolitical really has to do with what multiply marginalized communities do when they're not engaging in public facing resistance work, when they're not planning street protests, when they're not planning strikes. Um, so a lot of that work really is care work. So the infrapolitical is for me, I think a space wherein mutual aid and care labor happens amongst marginalized folks. And it's work that is absolutely necessary for any kind of more, more intense 
resistance to happen. Um, so another way of putting it, not immediately citing James C. Scott, is just to think that infopolitics is what happens when folks are hanging out and learning each other and becoming intimate with one another, not necessarily sexually or erotically, but that too. Um, and it's the work of social reproduction. It's the work that, you know, keeps, keeps us alive. And to understand that work is not just an adjunct to political resistance, but also, but is the stuff out of which political resistance is made is the reason why I find that concept so useful. Uh, the, one of the parts of the book where you talk about uh, infrapolitics and the infrapolitical ethic of care, I'm just going to say infrapolitics now because I'm like, oh, I totally understand that. Um, but it's in Tough Breaks, which is the the, deep, the essay that you, the chapter that you read from um, at the beginning of this piece. And I I love, I mean, I love all of side, of side affects and um, I feel like I have a special love for certain chapters in the book and, and the way that you engage with, with rage and transformation, um, but also the the notion of of breaking, right? And and what happens when when we break. Um, and I, I wanna just offer again, some of the things that I, that I found really potent there. And, and something I've been sitting with as well is like, where, where do trans care and the kinds of care work that circulate in queer and trans communities, like where do they really come together with disability justice? Of course, you know, thinking about really important works like Care Work Dreaming Disability Justice by Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samar Sinha, um, who also has a new book coming out this fall, a follow-up called The Future is Disabled. Um, but there's this passage in, in the book where you talk about um, basically like what happens when people break and, and you write, we associate instability with breaks precisely because of the radical differential of possible aftermaths, precisely because of these high stakes. Breaks scare us and others for that reason, but our survival is radically dependent on these others. What happens during and after a break depends on the communal uptake such breaks receive, how they are witnessed and understood. If one breaks, if one keeps breaking and is met only with criticism, pathology, censure, isolation, or institutionalization, the specter of suicide looms larger and larger. And, and some of what I feel like you do with that section of the book is challenge the carcerality, the ableism, the sanism that so often accompanies a break, right? Like what happens if someone ends up um, incarcerated in a psych ward against their consent, for example, versus the kinds of rich collective care practices that we co-create in communities, right? Like the work that I'm sure we've all done to keep loved ones out of psych wards, for example, because that's what they want and that's what they need in that moment, um, which demands a particular kind of community care. So I want to kind of move from, from that and like invite your reflections on, on those places in this moment of like heightened carcerality in so many facets of the world and, and so much need for care. Um, and I think also some of the thinking I know you've been doing around the places where we see certain like neoliberal logics really showing up around queer and trans health, including from within our communities, um, which I know you and Tuck talked about at the Blue Stockings launch, but um, is also something I know you and I have had salty feelings about for quite some time now. Um, the, the neoliberal privatization of care by and for our communities, um, which, wow, I really don't like. So would love to hear your thoughts on any and all of these things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what you, you totally nailed it when you framed the thinking about breaks in relationship to practices of keeping folks from being institutionalized because they did not want to be institutionalized. Um, and I think that there's a really intricate skill set that comes from doing that work. And some of us do it over and over again. Um, so I wanna sort of say thank you for just connecting those dots in a way that I don't think is explicit in the text. I feel like thinking critically about carcerality in relationship to the health system means that we have to think about collective care, which of course, right, is all about what you, what you do is all about doing that. Um, but also it necessitates thinking about 
what happens to us when we're engaged in that kind of collective care work over years and over decades, and also when we need that kind of care work ourselves. Um, so the reciprocity of these forms of collective care in relationship to keeping folks out of carceral systems, keeping folks because they're safer outside of those systems. Um, so there's something about what you're pointing to in the chapter on, on rage and on breaking that immediately links to everything I've written about burnout too. And I wanna kind of highlight that connection because I think burnout um, is one of the prime sites that like the ascendancy of neoliberal wellness culture has targeted and consistently offers up these deeply individualized modes of supposedly addressing burnout that actually don't ever effectively address burnout because what could address burnout is massive structural change. Um, working less, right? Having more resources to take care of ourselves and loved ones, both energetically, financially, right? And time-wise. And yeah, what am I trying to say? I'm mindful of time. So I'm, part of me is like looking at Halsey and thinking, okay, it's 7.52 and I want to hear from folks in the chat. So maybe let, let me stop with just that bridge between breaking and burnout and the, the where that happens when people do collective care labor um, over long periods of time over long durations? So I am going to just start going through um, some questions in the chat right now. We have three questions just so you can um, have expectations for what's about to happen. <laughs> um, this is actually going off of what you just talked about. So maybe you will have the opportunity to continue um, fleshing your thoughts out there. Um, but I guess like what you know, practical, like practical, you know, advice do you have for people who are trying to build, um, specifically like anarchist or, you know, not like basically going against like the hegemonic systems and kind of like trying to build collective care systems from the ground up, like what kind of advice do you have for, you know, you know, specifically like trans communities or queer communities, um, or, you know, just like anarchist communities who are trying to do that work. Yeah, this I, I feel like I often get advice questions and I'm so bad at them because I'm so I'm so uh, predisposed to criticality that being like, okay, well, here's what to do is not in my nature. Um, but I think one of the one of the first things I thought as you were framing the question was to uh, go slowly and consistently check in with the folks that you're collaborating with, that you're co-creating spaces and projects with. Um, in also on the other side of that, right, to let things die when they need to die, when they've run their course. Um, I think oftentimes folks stay committed to projects that become organizations or become nonprofits long after those, those organizations or collectives are functioning well in sort of serving the, the purpose that they had hoped to serve. So go slow and, um, think about infrastructure carefully and don't, don't institutionalize if you don't need to. <laughs> like stay flexible um, and responsive. And then also, I mean, of course, if you haven't read it, right, read Dean Spade's work on mutual aid and read as much other literature on the origins of that concept, the practice of that concept, as it plays out in radical queer and trans collective spaces as you can, right? To so learn lessons there. So, but I, but Zina's probably better with these questions, honestly, because Zina's so much more pragmatic than I am. I mean, I agree with everything you said. And I mean, I would say maybe just, just a, a couple of other kind of adjacent concrete suggestions, like on the Dean Spade piece specifically, um, I, I couldn't, I can't quickly pull up the videos, but um, I can find them and share them on Twitter, which is probably the easiest way I can sort of publicly do that. Dean, I know, also did a series with the Bernard Center for Research on Women, which was a, a mutual aid capacity building workshop series. And so my understanding, and I'll double check this, is that the video should be available online, I think captioned and with ASL, but it actually goes through specific kind of skills and tools that mutual aid groups um, would, would potentially want to be looking at in terms of that kind of practical skill building work. Um, 
I also just left the board of a small, um, you know, trans trans centered uh, nonprofit in the the city where I had been living for 20 years, which was a community created um, health center for for trans and gender diverse folks. You know, that was particularly created at a time when there was much less access to trans health care and, and especially by community for community well before informed consent hormone prescription, for example, was was um, the norm. Um, and it was really interesting to be part of that small organization, which was run collectively and, and has been now for a decade, um, and all of the kind of shape shifting that it's done over the years. Um, and I would say was a place where I kind of sat with in, in community with others, the complexities of the nonprofit industrial complex. Um, so the book, The Revolution Will Not Be Funded, um, which, which, was, which is an anthology created by Insight Women of Color Against Violence, is a really important critical history and look at the nonprofit industrial complex, um, as is Merle Beam's Gay Incorporated, um, which looks at that in, in an LGBTQ context in particular. Um, and I say that because I think the thing with nonprofits is they originate in a charity model that was like rich white land barons trying to protect their wealth and, and follow through on their agendas, which included things like eugenics, right? So not really a great model that we want to keep replicating. Um, and of course, I'm sure many of us are or know people who have been like destroyed by work in the nonprofit sector. Um, so like just kind of holding to the complexities as, as you were saying, Hill of the institutionalization kind of piece and the nonprofitization piece. Um, I think looking to disability justice and the work of people like Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samar Sinha, who looks at really practical examples in care work, um, is such an amazing resource. And, and I think just to also start small, like I went to a talk on transformative justice that Mia Mingus offered um, a couple of years ago. And pre-pandemic, I was in a room full of people, so it definitely has been a while now. But one of the things she talked about was um, like the idea of actually practicing transformative justice in our lives and intimate relationships. And so what does it look like to practice that care in our lives and intimate relationships before we feel like maybe we have to scale? Um, and how to know what's already happening in your community. Like if you're a white person like me, you know, being conscious of not like swooping in to solve a problem um, when perhaps there's already really rich and robust community created solutions that already exist and, and need to be supported. So I think there's a lot of really generative questions to be inside of. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm going to combine two questions together because I think that they go really well together. Um, the first one is for Hill. Um, you know, this uh, person is asking, um, this is part one, um, knowing about side effects, what would you change about your own transition and what would you have made major transition better, smoother, less dramatic? Um, you know, and I guess that is kind of within any context you want to address it in. And then um, a fault, the part two is, you know, regarding aging as trans. Um, and it being one issue that there hasn't even been the beginnings of a visual, visible societal place for us until um, recently. Um, so, you know, in relationship with transitioning and aging, like how do you imagine um, we can occupy um, that space and occupy ourselves over, you know, that elongated period of time? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. I think the two are definitely related to one another. And how I'm thinking of responding actually refers back to some of what Zena mentioned regarding intergenerationality within queer and trans communities. Um, so when I think about like how my transition could have gone smoother, I mean, it's, it's hard for me to answer. There are probably a million ways, right? If the medical industrial system were a little bit better equipped to deal with trans folks, if they had been, if it had been the system in the states that we encounter now, if you're in metropolitan areas where there are at least a handful of folks that operate with an informed consent model, that would have been great when I was a teenager. That would have been great when I was in my 20s, but that was not the case in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, at least not for folks who weren't like in New York City or in San Francisco or in LA. And even there it was spotty and um, tendentious often. So, but how this has, what this has to do with intergenerationality. I was very, very close with um, some older radical dykes when I was young and I had like several significant mentors that were 
like, you know, working class butch dykes in their forties and fifties when I was a teenager, when I was in my early twenties. And as I moved through um, college, as I moved through grad school, some of those older radical dykes were also professors of mine, right? Or I met others that were professors of mine and became academic mentors to me as well as sort of members of my extended queer kinship network. And to be totally blunt, some of them were real fucking bad about trans stuff. Um, and this meant that when I was a teenager, when I was in my early twenties, I would take sort of baby steps towards transition and then be like, whoa, am I gonna lose this sort of queer kinship network or is my position within um, these majority sort of radical dyke spaces going to be compromised by transitioning? And I was deeply, deeply afraid of that. And I think more so than the, the limited medical access and the gatekeeping around medical access that existed, I mean, what, what impeded me or was a real roadblock for me um, was worrying about that acceptance. And yeah, I mean, there's a lot more I could say about that. There's stories, there's gossip, there are like conflicts and confrontations. But I think that it also means that I'm much more predisposed now to be generous when there are older non-trans queer folks who aren't, a, aren't as great around trans issues as you would perhaps want them to be. So I think that that's really important to know too, right? That, that a commitment to queer intergenerationality means that you don't treat folks like that as if they're disposable or as if they're just beyond, um, <laughs> beyond some sort of pale, right? That they're not members of potential coalitions, collectives, and communities. As long as that's easier said than done. So I'll stop there just because I know we're a little over the hour and I want to hear from Zena on this bigger question. Yeah, I mean, I just I just um, sent a link to Halsey to share in the chat because I also feel like it's a, a beautiful example. Um, there's a, a really gorgeous project. It's a, a collection of photos and interviews with trans and gender nonconforming older adults called To Survive on the Shore. Um, and it's a collaboration between a photographer, um, Jess Duggan and Vanessa, Vanessa Fabre, who's a researcher. Um, and I, I remember when that project first came out and seeing so many people, and I write about this in The Carry Dream of so many people in my circle sharing it and sharing it and sharing it. And just like the photos are incredible, you know, and it's so beautiful to see so many visions of like what in this case, you know, trans aging can look like um, in all its its richness and, and possibilities, right? And I think that is, I think it's so important, again, coming back to like the nexus of ageism and ableism that keeps our communities so age segmented, right? Like um, if we think about uh, an abolitionist praxis, you know, there's so much thought about abolition around, of course, police and prisons. Um, certainly I'm thinking with abolition much more in my work now. Um, and the, the pandemic has really radicalized me much more around long-term care abolition and abolition of all institutions, all carceral institutions. And, um, you know, I think a lot about how, and I understand very much why this work is being done, like the um, emphasis on creating like more LGBTQ inclusive nursing homes. And I think that is absolutely an awful option for our communities because no one should be in an institution. Like we should deinstitutionalize full stop, right? Um, so I think again, really thinking about these, these solidarities and sort of systemic considerations and like fighting carcerality in all of the ways that it shows up, including in its entanglements with ableism, with ageism, of course, with white supremacy, settler colonialism, transphobia, homophobia, like all of the things that show up to discipline people's bodies and minds and like tell us that it's not possible to be as we are across the full possible spectrum of what our lifespan can be. So um, I think it can really be a radical act to like reclaim the possibility of aging, you know? And um, I think many of us don't know how to do that. Like I, I, I'm still learning, I'm still learning. Like I turn 43 at the end of the month and I'm specifically was saying to my partner that I want to make my birthday party theme this year, which will be a small gathering in my yard because it's still a pandemic, like age fest, and that, that it's just going to be a celebration of getting older. Um, and I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm interested in creating space for my little queer community here and the small community I live in now. 
um, to, to think about that together. So we have one last question left and I think it could um, be even like a quick one. Um, so we have one audience member who is specifically looking for um, additional resources, like um, whether that be any, it's they, they specifically said any literature. So that includes not just like critical um, theory uh, or like, you know, social science writing or research writing, but also fiction, poetry, um, especially um, that you have read that have helped you think through um, with, you know, trans and queer and negative affect and also practices of care, um, especially if they both kind of address or the literature addresses both of those issues at the same time. And I will be radically dropping links in the chat for people to access these books. So please feel free. <laughs> yeah, so I, I will say a few just right off the top of my head. One is T. Fleischmann's Time is a Thing the Body Moves Through. I love that book so much. Um, but there's a real attentiveness to the role of negative affect in radical queer collective living that is present in that book that I think is so beautiful and complex. And then the other is the, the classic, the faggots of their friends between revolutions, which I think some folks might already be familiar with that are here, um, that came out of, it's fictional, but it comes out of the experience of this commune called the Lavender Hill Commune in the late 1970s that was based outside of Ithaca, New York, near where I used to live. So I'm partial to it for so many reasons. But um, yeah, it really, similar to T. Fleischmann's work, details the role of negative affect in queer collective living and also why queer collective living is so often so difficult and compromised for folks, hard to engage over the long term. Right? Like there's a reason why a lot of these radical back to the land projects from the 70s that queer folks were engaging in are no longer around, or if they are, people don't want to keep them going or move to the land that was established. And this is leaving aside all of the questions about settler coloniality and whether back to the land projects are like a good thing or a desirable move. I think they're not, um, <laughs> but, but that's the side. Um, so those two off the top of my head, there's so, so, so many others though. And I'm looking at Zena to be like, what did what did you? And I'm I'm you? trying to I'm I'm collaboratively unmuting myself. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, I read and li and listen to podcasts, and I'm just kind of constantly sponging information into my brain, um, just because it's kind of how I am. Um, I'm not an academic. Like, I'm trained trained PhD trained, but but left academia on purpose, um, and just really like to to think and learn all the time. Um, I mean, I will say, I feel like a hugely transformative lineage and ongoing kind of movement and body of thought and practice that has had a very foundational impact on, on my work and is really evident in the shift between the remedy and the care we dream of um, in the evolution of my own thinking has really been about learning from and with disability justice, which is a continuing process of learning and a practice, right? Um, and it's very much a lineage grounded in, you know, cutie BIPOC, like queer and trans, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, um, disabled communities and lineages, you know, people like Patty Byrne, people like Leroy Moore, you know, Sins Invalid on, on the East Coast of the U.S., um, West Coast of the U.S., where I've just mixed up geography, Oakland, um, just downstairs from here. Um, I am on the, also on the West Coast. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would say like things like the Sins and Valid Disability Justice Primer, um, books like Aurora Levin's Morales, um, Kindling, Writing on the Writings on the Body, um, Eli Clare's uh, Brilliant Imperfection, Grappling with Cure is, is a really important book for me. Um, Care Work, Dreaming Disability Justice, which I've mentioned a couple times. And um, Shada Kafai has a beautiful recent book called Crip Kinship, which is all about Sins and Valid. And um, I feel like what those offered me was something really similar to, in some ways, what learning more about police and prison industrial complex abolition has done for me, which has enabled me to think so differently about what's possible for solidarities, for systemic transformation, like for the kind of world building that is necessary. Um, and, and really coming back to a line that I have learned from Sins Invalid, which is we move together with no body or mind left behind, right? And um, really thinking about what would it mean to actually build our movements and our care practices around that kind of a commitment and to put that into action. 
I want to add one more recommendation really quick because it was so formative for me. Um, and that's Anne Spekovich's book, Depression of Public Feeling, which is behind side effects entirely because in that book, she reconceives of depression as fundamentally a collective political phenomenon. So it was like a total game changer. I really, I believe I speak for all of us whenever I say from the bottom of my heart, thank you both so much. This did not disappoint. In fact, it exceeded my expectations for what I even hope to be possible of like the absolute highest point. So you literally just made probably my whole year. So thank you both so much for making my year, for being here with us tonight, all the way from the West Coast. Um, I do invite everybody to clap react because it is much deserved. Um, and please, everybody go ahead and get your copy of side affects. I'm going to go ahead and drop it in the chat one more time, um, as well, get the care, um, we dream of. I'm going to also drop that in the chat one more time. Zena and Hill are definitely some writers who are contributing to a long standing um, lineage that I think all of us in this Zoom chat um, care very deeply about. Um, and we're just, I'm just very grateful for your scholarship um, in these ways. So thank you so much. Um, have, oh, and then perfect. And then Zena actually just um, sent me a super incredible resource for all of you. This is um, uh, the Care We Dream Of reading guide. So that Google Doc is in the um, is in the chat for you. Please go ahead and um, click on that while it's still there. So I'm just going to give you a second um, to do that. But I hope everybody here has a fabulous rest of your Thursday. Um, enjoy. I hope that it's spring where you are. <laughs> Finally, I know that in some places it's not spring yet. Um, so I hope that it's spring where you are and stay safe out there. Everybody have a fabulous night. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Halsey. You're welcome.